Welcome to the Life Science and Marketing Podcast, where we discuss marketing and career insights and tips with leading experts from across the globe. Let's join our host, Paul Avery, CEO of Biostrata, as he chats with our next Life Science Marketing guest. I'm joined today by renowned life science marketing expert, James Smith. Uh, I first met James during his distinguished stint at CRO in Vigo, where James worked for well over a decade. These days, James is Global Director of Marketing at the Lab Automation Specialist, SPT LabTech. Welcome to the podcast, James. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, and uh, thanks for the, uh, the great intro there. I'm not sure distinguished. Maybe my grey hair is showing there. <laughs> Level of distinguishedness that I now have, but uh, yeah, but that's it's very kind of you to say. Thank you. No worries. I thought about saying the amount of years you'd been at a v- in Vigo, but I thought maybe over a decade yeah. was probably better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, indeed, that's probably uh, keep me feeling a bit young, Paul. Keep me Absolutely. Young. Well, I, and I didn't want to give too many details away about your story because I thought it would be great for the audience if you tell your story yourself and you tell us about how your career has weaved and wound to get you to where you are today. Oh, right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, lots of luck and uh, some good bosses. But uh, no, I think, you know, if I really go back, it's actually my first step into proper work was after university and, you know, uh, travels around the world, et cetera. My friend had a job going as a concierge at what is now the Hilton Cambridge in in, in town. And I started there and um, just put myself about the hotel and ended up in the sales office as coordinator. I managed to uh, influence that they need to do more on marketing. Um, and so I was lucky enough to kind of carve out a marketing manager role in the hotel for a while. And that got spotted. And again, that, that was fortuitous that I was actually speaking to one of the regionals um, leads. And they were actually looking to put in regional marketing managers uh, across the UK, picking up a number of different holiday inns and crown plazas. So I, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to start there uh, as a regional marketing manager for the region of 12 hotels, I think it was, around London, um, North London, and sort of East, East Anglia yeah. and a little bit north as well. So mm-hmm. uh, that sort of cut my, 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 my path, I suppose, into proper marketing and having a proper marketing role rather than, you know, doing a few posters in a hotel, right. uh, which, you know, the, the, the highlighter and latte scenario that puts around marketing uh, was certainly that's where it started um, but that kind of led on to my next step I, I moved off of that role um, into uh, a law firm for a short period um, and that was a completely change of different field different kind of perspectives what the end audience was but it's still kind of service provision you know um, so it's still kind of trying to get across what the value is what that service was in a way by which the audience could understand and digest that, I suppose. And that was more of your basic stuff back then, you know, a few email blasts, purchase lists, you know, the, 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 the naughty dark worlds of, of those kind of things. <laughs> and it, it was okay. You know, I, I just couldn't quite get into it. it. It just didn't float my boat as much as hotels did. And, you know, one thing or another, I think that showed in, in some of the output and I, I really wasn't enjoying it. So mm-hmm. opportunity to then go and join ProQuest, which was, you know, the same as Elsevier, the same as uh, Cambridge University Press and things like that. And that was my first management role, as in having people in the team. And I walked into this team and they're like, oh yeah, you've got somebody in, uh, where was it? Um, Kuala Lumpur. You've got somebody in um, Brazil. Um, and wow. you've got somebody in, in the Cambridge office. And you know, on joining us, yeah, but the first week we're sending to Kuala Lumpur because we need to go and, re- you know, replace somebody. And it's like, okay, fantastic. First manager role, I'm flying off to kind of Kuala Lumpur. Ended up twisting my ankle playing football the day before. And oh, no. Kuala Lumpur. But it, it paid benefits because I, I managed to get three seats because I didn't have to elevate my leg, otherwise it was going to swell too much. Right. So, you know, that, that, that role was, I, I love that role. It's first management, I'm always doing um, distributor um, marketing events in Budapest. We were in London, where it, like it's this really kind of energized, global kind of role, working with people that were kind of similar age and a bit older. So there's that kind of youthful buzz to things, but you had a kind of good steering head mm-hmm. and a mature head, kind of giving strategy direction. 
And we're out there doing those tactical campaigns in different countries with different channels. Uh, and again, started to learn a little bit more about audience segmentation and where, you know, global impact is working with the South Americans, completely different to working with the Asian teams and those, and I, and I just really love that role, but unfortunately due to a, um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, but yeah, a Sarbanes-Oxley incident, um, there was redundancy. So I was like, right. oh. so I was kind of in my first house. Um, I think my first child was you know, due quite, quite soon. Um, and I had no job and I was like, okay, well, just, just have to get on with things. I suppose, went to a few agencies, did the usual, you know, been in marketing, done these kind of things, mm -hmm. et cetera, put, platform yourself up a little bit. Um, and somebody said, oh, we've got this job at Huntington. Uh, they're looking for a marketing officer, I think it was called at the time. And as I say, I was like, okay, it's a job. Um, I'll give it some time, like we all do sometimes, find a role that we think, oh, we're going to stay in it for a year or two, and then I'll go back to hospitality or something. But mm -hmm. as you say, 13 years later, <laughs> I left there. Um, having entered into that role, I suppose, with very, very little, if none, of the understanding of pharmaceutical development, nothing in the life sciences, all based around you know, hospitality and, you know, online data repositories. Now, how does that transfer into, into the pharma, pharma world or certainly life sciences, preclinical, non-clinical? And that was a huge learning curve. It was kind of not only maturing again in a, in a marketing position, but maturing in kind of an understanding how scientists work and how animal techs work and all that everything in between really and starting to understand what those customers started to look like okay what's a safety pharmacology study what's a top study what's a whole non-clinical package look like i and d submissions and, and all these kind of jargons and acronyms coming at you at the same time as you're trying to make that groove in your marketing role mm -hmm. and so i think that comes to the point of learning from those around you and it's taking and absorbing the words you know there's people out there i'll shout out to you know lee coney and um all the, the the kind of product management team that that helps me understand what is this drug development pipeline thing what are the stages through to clinical what do people need to see and what are our buyers actually looking for and it kind of i don't know it's quite a transition from working in hospitality where it's kind of this something you can imagine you know you're walking into a room and it's got this plush thing yeah. and you're going to relax in the bar and then this kind of intangible feeling that you're going to create in someone's mind from marketing it's science knows data james data 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 where's the data point you should put all this marketing fluff around it you can put all this messaging around it but at the end of the day the scientists are looking for that data point and i just remember ken reach from head of safety pharmacology and he was so anti-marketing but at the same time, understood the impact that, you know, the, the vehicle could help him kind of communicate what he felt was a requirement. And he'd change this data point, this data point, that's all they're there to see. So, okay, so I started to understand that. And then, okay, well, how do you, how do you kind of put some butterfly effect around that data? And how does that flow out? Um, and things, helping them do presentations, helping them do posters, helping them to maybe message and platform in a different ma ma manner than a thousand points on a PowerPoint slide, which, you know, the, people listening to this will probably, um, understand the challenge of, oh, I've done a slide deck. I just really need you to make it look pretty. Okay. You <laughs> want me to make it look corporate? You want me to make the messages clear and succinct? And you're like, oh yeah, they, they, those kind of things, because they have such great things to say, but it's how they're saying it is just, you know, it's, it's, it's in the world of the scientist's brain and it's mm. kind of, um, not necessarily as, as structures as it could be in depth. Some of them, I'm not saying that's everybody, um, didn't need that much help, but, uh, so yeah, how, so did that's you, how, did see, right. how did you get people of a scientific background to embrace and understand how marketing could help them be more successful or the business be more successful? It's clarity of message and just showing that you don't have to say everything in one way. You could, you could do things in multiple formats. You could do things in multiple, um, styles or tone, and it could be very accessible, basic, um, ABCs, marketing 101. Yeah, you know, I think we did a series, monoclonals 101. We did safety pharmacology 101. So, so 
there's always people new to a market and new to an industry and you've got people coming out of the university and yes, they're in their first role on the bench, et cetera. So you need to make things for them, but also at the other end, you need to have the very detailed, be it a white paper, an article, a scientific poster, and letting the scientists know that we should kind of tell their story in different ways and different formats helps to bridge that gap a little bit because then they started to see, oh, right, okay, that makes it more meaningful for the audience. They can actually digest some of what I'm trying to say. Right. And they don't, and the people that are already experts, they don't need to see your 101. They want to see that cutting edge uh, data point, as we said earlier. And they want to understand how you got there and what the validity is and how robust that data is and et cetera. Whereas, say, 101, oh, right, that's how monoclonals go through the safety development pathway. That okay, I can start to grasp now that. And that helped our internal audience accept marketing in a way because they started to understand that we could help them actually get their point across in a clearer, in a clearer fashion. Right. And reach those different audiences at different stages of technical competency. Yeah. And I guess for some of the experts that you'd have been dealing with many years of experience may have almost forgotten what it was like to be a junior because they're world-renowned experts in the field and have that technical knowledge. But as you said, plenty of new people coming into the market at any given point that you can build trust with by helping them on that initial part of the journey as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So I, also, uh, I, I don't know if you want me to finish on the CRO bit. Or if yeah, done that yeah bit. tell us a bit more, James. <laughs> I've got a question about ProQuest, so I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, okay, no worries. Yeah. So, so Huntington then is like, well, let's go and buy somebody. Let's be bigger. Let's, you know, had two sites, three sites globally. So we ended up being Harlan Laboratories. And so it went to 53 sites across 14 countries, 4,000 people. And myself and my, my boss at the time, Joe Bedford, uh, and a couple of other colleagues, right, we need to rebrand. We're buying this company. So we had to do brand exercises. Well, what's the value of the Huntington brand? What's the value of the Harlem brand? Where's the middle ground? If we go somewhere new, what can we do? And that's how Invigo was born. And basically, uh, I think that's probably one of my biggest deliverables in a marketing perspective is around the launch of Invigo across those sites internally, mm -hmm. but also externally going to, you know, shows like SOT, Society of Toxicology. I remember San Diego and um, where we... We, we chatted a few weeks ago, Paul, actually. Um, but uh, I had the envisionment I was going to turn up and dip my feet in the pool and have a nice relaxing time in San Diego, et cetera. From the minute I landed to the minute I left, I was working with where I had Harlan management, we had Huntingdon management, and we we're trying to get these two people, you know, these groups together to under, you know, have the same message uh, at that show. And that was kind of the bigger project externally. How do we take Invigo now to, to the masses? But it wasn't actually launched yet. And so he's kind of having to manage this interim process, I suppose. But eventually we got to Invigo. We launched on the 25th of September, 2015. A, a date burned in my head, <laughs> you know, working up that weekend on doing the website and Mark's in Carriage and Sam Luck, a um, couple of guys that work with me in the digital team, just putting out all the stops to get there to launch Invigo. And it, it was a great experience. And I think, you know, maybe it's a question for later. What's one of your biggest achievements? That was certainly, certainly it. So we can come back to that a little bit if we need to. And then eventually success attracts um, investment. Hunt, uh, you know, Vigo was bought out by Covance, LabCorp, et cetera, which gave me then the opportunity to step back. And that's where I joined what was TTP LabTech. And uh, very soon with the experience, I said, oh, we've done that with Vigo. We need to change our name now to SPT LabTech. Um, for reasons um, in terms of the, the, the deal then we, when we stepped away from TTP Group. And so that was my first kind of foray into to TTP. So then it was kind of more of that than learning all the instruments and the, the actual process, and that came later. So three and a half years later, I'm here, yeah, director, of, director of marketing. I've got a great team around me. I've got people that come with me from Invigo. Um, you know, big shouts out to... There's like a radio DJ there, um, you know, <laughs> Carrie, Carrie Rooks and John Igo, who, you know, came over with me, um, to come and do something special at SBT lab tech. And then last year with us, you know, refreshing our financing model, uh, was a huge, great experience as well for, for me, if we want to come onto that later, but, um, that's, that's kind of the story so far, really. You had a question about progress. Amazing. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you telling that story. And I think it's so much 
it brings so many elements to life that we're not going to get from your LinkedIn profile, right? Which I really appreciate. So, so thanks for bringing us to that. Yeah, my question about ProQuest was coming into a first management role, you've got direct reports internationally, right? This is pre, this isn't pre, this is pre pandemic, right? This is not Zoom is commonplace. You needed to get on a plane straight away and go fly and meet with your direct reports. Like, how was that as an experience? What did you learn from? Diving into management and being an international manager from the get-go. I was completely naive, Paul, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, and as you say, it was, it was pre-anything, really. It was 2000, you know, I'll show my age now, uh, 2006, maybe, 2007. Um, actually, no, it was 2005. 2005. So I just got married. Um, yes, internet was still this thing that was kind of newish and exciting here and, you know, dial up and the usual noise and buzz. <laughs> you got five, five emails a day. Um, but yes, that started really kicking off, I suppose, when I joined there. But it was, it was, it was the, I stumbled, you know, in all honesty, but I stumbled my way through that first six months. Um, it would be telephone calls, be emails. You know, we would we we had other teams that we'd aligned with. So we had the strategic marketing manager setting direction. We had the marketing team that would execute um, in terms of assets and content, etc. And we were the kind of real sharp end execution. What have we sent? So we had mailing houses in Malaysia, and you know, still hard copy stuff going out. Um, and I never got to South America. That was one one, one shame. I you know, love a bit of surfing, and I never made it to to, to, to the beaches of Brazil, but. Um, they came over, we had the team use so much more personal phone calls. It was, you know, you can be on a video call with a few people and you kind of, you engage as much as you want to engage with it, it was back then one-to-one -one on a video call, it's like calling your nan, you know, you, you engage for that hour, you had to invest in that hour. Mm. And so you'd, you'd create your connection through that, through email. And then once every six months they were over and you know, your team would go out, but it was, it was the start of the journey of like those supervisor courses, you know, all the, all the cliche things you think that a company, are they boring and, you know, got to go and do learning. I thrived on those things. It gave you a direction. It gave you a, a framework and my, I think I'm, I'm an, an analytical, uh, expressive. So I love data and robustness and, you know, diving into a process. But at the same time, I'm the worst person for policing that sometimes. And so there's two, the kind of thing's a bit schizophrenic, I suppose, in terms <laughs> of the way I do things. But having a process, everybody's followed it. We all kind of, uh, and, and that way we can always look back on, well, what's happening in, the, in Asia versus South America versus UK, US, et cetera. So um, that's what I learned. Get a process going, right. work it. It doesn't have to be the most involved process but something you can all have a common language on that you're all contributing to because then you know, are we doing well there? Are we not doing so well there? Who needs support? What local, uh, you know, how do you need me to talk to your local management? Because that was a big thing that those people remotely would just be utilized and brutalized by the local management that, oh yeah, right. we, we've got a local campaign to go. No, you don't need to tell about global. And so understanding more and more about the politics of business, uh, not to say that it's a negative thing, but they just wanted to do more local things that they didn't have to go through the red tape of bureaucracy to get to. How do you um, overcome? How do you overcome that? Because I think a lot of a lot of marketers that have global offices with you know local marketing teams have that challenge and the politics aspect. How do you manage for that? It's just uh, my. My route in on that one is just trying to understand, well, what are you trying to achieve that's different to what global's trying to achieve, but on a local basis? What is it, the dynamics that we're not getting to see here that really we need to understand? Because in actual fact, it doesn't always just flow down from the top. Some of the best ideas come from the ground up, the guy on the street, the lady doing the next appointment, feeding back stuff that actually makes a difference mm -hmm. versus sitting in the ivory global tower and thinking, well, that's what people want. You've it's that flow back into the business that really opens your mind up. And so once I'd got over the defensiveness of no, no, it's global, you have to do it this way. And you know, you have to follow our, our, our messaging, et cetera. You actually then start to think that can make my life easier because 
I'm actually getting some really good input from that. And then once you then connect with that local management to understand what they're trying to do, it's no longer a battle. It's then it becomes more of a partnership. Just mm -hmm. getting over that ego thing of like, no, we're global. You do what we say versus no, there's some really good people doing some really good stuff locally and you should listen. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. By directional vulnerability, right? Like we're, we're global, yeah, but we can learn from you and having them be vulnerable enough to say, actually, if you could help here and here, if we can tell you what we need, we can do more and, and get more and better results without having to do everything ourselves. Yes. Yep. I would say. Yep. Oh, interesting. Well, on that tip then, and using the word tip quite literally, what other things have you learned in your career so far professional lessons and tips that you would give perhaps to someone just starting out or the greatest lesson that you feel you've learned so far oh, i would say tip for starting out just listen listen more than you do don't try and do things to try and impress people too quickly go and listen in meetings go and throw yourself into scenarios that you probably wouldn't naturally think oh i'll go and join that because you haven't been invited build a network that's the thing go and listen to that network because you'll find so much out far more um to say far quicker and more in depth if you just have the right teacup conversations with somebody in a corridor or uh go and join a meeting that you're not necessarily invited to but show enthusiasm to try and understand mm -hmm. and you'll be accepted rather than going in going well i'm the marketing person i'm going to tell you what to do etc cetera, etc cetera. this is how we should do it um that was something i, I kind of learned because of hotels and things you were one person and so what you said went to a point because there was nobody okay. else to think about it whereas you get into somewhere bigger there's people that have been through the the mill a little bit more and they've got better experience and they they've seen things work and that's not necessary in a marketing perspective that's just general how that business works so i say and my my view on things changed the more i listened and i think that's the biggest i would say to anybody going to any role is just sit back and listen don't try and change things too quickly Mm, that's great advice there's that old adage you've got two ears and one mouth and that should give you the uh ratio of how much speaking to listening you should do but it's yeah. quite quite hard to stick to i find yeah. but to add to that one if you've got two eyes observe things see how things work you know just sit back and watch how things develop and watch and learn what others do and that's a, a big how do they manage to get through the the bureaucracy of a big company or how do they make relationships? So mm. watch as well. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important that you that's, uh, that's great advice. I think that's one of my regrets, if you like, of the pandemic and and so much working from home is I think for junior and mid-level staff, there's such an amazing opportunity to absorb by just being around people, having conversations about stuff in the way that you described that I think is probably a bit harder in the remote world. And if if there's ways to engineer getting yourself into those zoom calls or those other meetings even though you're remote to try and replicate what you're describing james in an in a remote first world yeah yeah and i think the pandemic has had an impact on us all to be fair you know when how many phone calls do i now take i don't take that many in the office it's kind of unless it's a zoom meeting or put it in a diary i'm not really wanting to talk to anybody i could be quite gated and i think mm. we've all become that you know I'd, yeah, I'd rather just send an email again and just carry on and um but having phone calls they're just so defunct now i think you know and, and like we've got here this interaction it's far more you can access you can read body language you can understand the person if they're listening etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. um i think but there's a skill being on the phone sometimes and i think we've probably lost that a little bit mm -hmm. and sometimes if somebody phones me i'll leave i, I shan't answer i'll leave it to go to voicemail then i'll have a look um, see who phoned me and I think, oh, if it's important, I'll phone them back, but, uh, just text me. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, don't, I don't know what that says about me, but, uh, I think I've probably come a bit of an introvert in terms of the pandemic and not wanting to talk to too many people. Um, I don't think you're alone. I think, I think these scheduled calls tend to be the way, but then I guess slightly outside of what we're discussing, but if you want to differentiate your approach, if you're a business development person, or if you're looking for a new role, picking up the phone, ringing pers a person, definitely be prepared to leave an answer phone message because I'm the same as you. <laughs> I'll wait and, and then call back. That's a challenge from, for, for marketing, though, you know, in, in all seriousness, is that 
those dynamics, you know, direct mail was what once landed on the desk, you see it, you know, I might get two pieces a month, you know, a couple of magazine subscriptions that get sent across to me and your inbox is so full, LinkedIn email is so full, except, you know, finding somewhere clear now, in actual fact, if something landed on my desk and it was a bit more thought about, and it's a little bit, okay, that's tangible. I could get hold of it and read it. Again, maybe it's my age at 40 odd, you know, I like to read things offline now. Um, but there's something for marketers in there about what has changed in that dynamic. You know, are, people aren't taking their phone calls so much. People aren't in their office so much. And you look at the LinkedIn ads, business done anywhere. And you've got these images of dads holding babies on a jogging machine and all this kind of stuff. And to be fair, you know, it's not that extreme, but getting hold of people in a meaningful place is quite difficult now. And they, if people aren't in work as much as they are, is, is their mindset on a work scenario, if they're traveling, commuting, if they're traveling around, if they're working from home, is it harder to ta- get people to focus on the things that you want them to focus on um, or offer them experiences or content that actually is distracting enough to take them away from what's now become a far more open Everyone can get hold of anyone in the mm-hmm. digital space, but physically, how do you how do you get people back into that physical space? And I think there's a there's an excitement and energy to get back to events. I've seen that, you know, going back to old school traditional channels, and people think, ah, oh, you know, digital's the coolest. Well, you and I were in San Diego a couple of weeks ago, and we started. It was a throng of people. You know, it's the busiest event I've seen for years. And it showed this level of enthusiasm and appetite to get human again, human to human stuff versus the digital world. But it's kind of, we're in this mid ground where people want to step back into it, but people are still this legacy. Let's do another webinar. Let's do you know, more email, et cetera, et cetera. So I think going forward for the next couple of years, where that land's going to lie, it's going to be really interesting to see, do we slip back to the, the older, more traditional channels because people just feel that they missed out on that or people just enjoyed that more or is there going to be some new digital things that are going to be distracting and need to take away from where we are today in the norm and has they got a fatigue now about LinkedIn um Twitter and you know the other the other part have they, have they got old have they got stale are they not going anywhere and what's now going to come and I think that's where this whole distraction on AI and the chat around that what's what what are these communities that are going to grow and how are they going to platform and how are they going to communicate beyond what today looks like because five years ago we couldn't think what today looked like five years time what does that look like and i think we're starting to see you know chat gpt coming through and etc cetera, etc cetera. but are, are they going to stick are they going to move on where are they actually going to land and are they going to be actually practical tools that we're going to use every day or are they going to be flashing the pound because they're just the kind of early adopters own, you know, early, uh, early technologies, then actual fact, bring something else that's going to be a bit more, uh, mainstream. Mm. So, so yeah, anyway, I've gone off on a right. No, there, I, so, yeah. I think, I think you're right. I think it's all of the above. I mean, you and I, James and people listening to this podcast, we're in the attention economy, right? We're basically battling to get people's attention and interest. And if everyone's zigging, you zag. And if, Ooh. and if the zigging at the moment is digital, and direct mail and, and events and other human to human type um, channels are the zag, then it's wherever you, there's less uh, attention um, competition, right? Which I think on the direct mail piece, uh, we've talked about this for a number of years as that being an opportunity, especially when you align it against something like account based marketing, where you can really do a, a really nice direct piece that's yeah. customized to that person or that account. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. I think our job will be to continue to look at where that arbitrage is, get in on those channels offline or online before marketers do what they do, right? Oversaturate things and basically ruin it for everybody else. So we need to be in the, in the early adoption phase of those before they get ruined, whilst also betting on the ones that actually people do care about and pay attention to and finding that sweet spot's really hard, isn't it? Yep. No, completely agree. Um, be interesting next couple of years. I think technology just develops quicker and quicker and quicker every year. It just seems to shorten until the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And I think as marketers, as you say, it's very hard to kind of ensure that you're, you're working those. And it comes, 
and a, and a little bit of that comes back to channel management and channel reporting. And I think that's something we should probably kind of look into, you know, attribution and the word attribution and, you know, digital is easy to, um, measure offline is harder to measure, but then when you've actually put it all together, the buyer journey from the multiple points that somebody's dropped in against to get to their buying decision, it's not like first touch, last touch, W touch, hockey stick touch, and all the other models that you come up with. And so I think whatever comes will need to have its, have a solid grounding in kind of the attribution because to get investment in that, I think going forward from those that are not in marketing and they just want to see, well, the dollar spent to the dollar returned, that's going to be interesting because how the, the journey is only going to get more complicated, mm. more platforms, more things, how do you track all the way through, through that? It's most, it's difficult enough now, you know, you look at digital tells you one direction when you actually talk to the customer, what buyer journey they went through. No, I just use in, I just use organic search to find you because I, in my head, I was top of mind, I had that, that had that challenge. I thought, oh, well, yeah, I'll try them because I've heard of them. Might as well start somewhere. And that wasn't from that one email you sent six months ago. It wasn't because the same salesperson six months ago. They might have bumped into you 18 months ago. Then they saw an advert. Then they saw an article. Then they spoke to their friend. And, and all this, how do you track that? And I think that's a massive challenge for marketers today. And I think that's what, coming back to that point, is, is where we go with marketing over the next five years. What's going to allow us to have a better view or is it just going to get more difficult with third parties disappearing? You know, first, first party, you know, um, on the cookie, cookie front, yeah, yeah. The cookie front, you know, all this sort of stuff. Where, where does that go? The, 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 the digital vision is actually getting smaller. The ability to see the digital footprint getting harder, Apple blocking email open you know, stats and things like this, it's, it's getting tougher. So what's going to come that's going to make it easier. I don't know. I think it's going to get harder and harder. But whilst companies are looking for more and more actual efficiency and go, well, okay, where's my marketing dollar and where's my ROI? So I kind of that, put all that into a pot and be like, well, it's going to be really interesting times over the next couple of years to really get, is it refined labs view on things or everything's dark social and you don't ever know what that real story is versus a HubSpot taking the position of, oh no, it's still there. The clarity's there. You need to trust the data. And then you have these third parties that are going to come that we haven't even invented yet. How are they going to report things? And how on earth, as a, as a marketer, are you going to get all that into a pot? And I think that's where, if I look back to where I started marketing, like doing pictures and a few flyers for hotels, to where it is today, of you need to be a data analyst, you need to be able to see trends, you need to understand technology, et cetera. As a marketer today, it's far bigger than yeah, what people presume marketing is. And I always do on my inductions, a very quite detailed breakdown of where marketers have to sit today between the legal frameworks we have to work to and all the parameters around, yeah, board pressure. And then you've got sales pressure. Then these other things that come in to, 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 to busy your day as such of people needing help and support for marketing, uh, to step up and help them. It's, it's kind of what a marketer is today is so different to what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm really interested to see what next five years in marketing is going to bring um, and what people's skills are going to be looking for. Is it far more data scientists? Is it customer excellence teams? Is it um, voice of customer getting a bit of more of a, a attraction? ABM has been here for two or three well, 45 years now in the mainstream and, you know, where's that got to now? And that was the big solution for everybody. And that's kind of, yes, it's a solution. Inbound was a solution. Outbound was a solution. And what's, what's coming next? That's, that's what I'm really interested in seeing. Well, let's talk about that because you were, one of the things I love about you, James, is you see these trends very, very early, right? You're very, very early into inbound marketing in the life sciences, probably one of the first companies I know that was doing it when you were when you were in Vigo. Again, you were building out quite complex and sophisticated account-based marketing strategies before it was prevalent in the life sciences. So what trends are you paying attention to that you think are going to influence how you market over the next 12 to 24 months? It, it's, it's got harder to see, to be fair, um, because there's so much going on. And I think one of the notes I wrote down for this, 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 this podcast and one of the questions, what, 
what would you pass on to other marketers? And it's the shiny ball syndrome. Keep away from the shiny ball syndrome. And I think that's my biggest, my biggest fear at the moment. There's so many you could follow and there's so many things that you could get absorbed into and rabbit hole yourself down to and thinking, how are we positioned to get, you know, the HubSpot link to chat GPT and how does, how does that link going to work and what we're going to utilize there? And then you start to look at it and go, okay, where well, you're going to have to open up your data sources a little bit. Are we happy with that? Are we happy with that? You know, can AI help really in what we do every day? And I could spend hours and weeks looking and evaluating, is that the right step for us? But it could be a complete waste of time. Mm. I just think it's going back to basics a little bit to start with. With that, what we just spoke about for the last 15 minutes, it's, it's such a confused state where people are coming out pandemic, do they want traditional? What they want digital? Do they want to go super hyper digital and everything becomes on everything becomes online and everything I do is tracked and seen and people know about me? No, it's closing down. You can't. It's not going that way either. So where is it really going? And I think there's going to be a period by which it just has to settle somewhere because otherwise everyone's going to get too confused by it. All. Everyone's going to get distracted by it. And I think even where people and now fully connected all the time. Is that the right way to talk to people now? And one of our projects coming up in the next few months is to really, again, go back to basics to understand, let's talk to people. Let's not assume them by there because they've got a data point here and a data point there. Let's go out and speak to the people that are buying in a segment. Let's really understand what the buyer journey, and then we can start to see which channels that really start to make a difference in their world. And what actually makes a difference, not another 16 reasons to 101, et cetera, you know, another ebook on X it's, mm -hmm. it's, I needed this then. Now it's quite difficult when you really get down to what people are doing every day, because on the bench, they could be doing a very niche protocol and these assay and, you know, with lab automation, how on, you know, there's not many people doing what you need to do. So to try and find a solution for that, mm -hmm. so to try and understand them. So it's really taking out, you know, where, what's happening in you know, NGS, say, you know, genomics, et cetera. What are people on the bench really needing at that time? What they really need to understand? What do the people investing at that mid-level, you know, lab manager up to lab director, what are they looking for? Because to try and change a path and mentality of somebody's buying pattern is a huge thing now. Mm. It's even more complicated than it was before. So where does that, where does that take us? And I think we need to understand that as marketers, don't jump into the next shiny ball. Just go and speak to your customers again. And there's nothing new. There's nothing groundbreaking. It's not like James's 20 years of marketing led him to a really kind of, you know, clarity moment. It's, it's kind of, we could get sucked into doing loads of stuff because we think we should. I think it's time to go back and go, are we really doing the things that we should be? And do we have the data be that digital mixed with human impact? Do we really have the data sent in the right direction to try and identify that 5% of people that are actually buying at any one time, um, rather than swarming the market? And are we doing lead gen for lead gen sake because it hits a metric for marketing numbers every month? <laughs> Maybe. Um, but some of that pays off. So is it, it's not right just to drop lead gen. It's not right to just do inbound. It's not just right to do outbound. It's not right just to do ABM. And I think it's that understanding where, where does the business need to go? Mm -hmm. What do you need to do with your customers? Do you need to level up? Do you need to level down? It's, 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 it's in transition. I think it is it, where we are. It's no clear pre COVID. You knew where you were post COVID. I don't know if we all know where we need to be. And I think going back to basics, it's all right, let's just check ourselves before we go again. So that would be my kind of view on what's coming. Um, yeah, I, I found it difficult to try and find that next thing to jump. And I think it's about what we've already got, maximize that and then see what, see what's over the horizon. I think that's good advice. And I think one of the great things about experience is it allows you to extract simplicity from com complexity. Um, and I, I hadn't thought about it like, it like that until you said it, but certainly there's a lot of competing things out there at the moment and they feel quite polar, right? It's like 
let we should blog five times a day using chat gpt because we can or mm. we should do one really good piece a month that's so super valuable to the audience that we're targeting super customized maybe not even written right maybe it's video or a mm. podcast like this well they are at polar extremes right we should be having the most complex lead scoring and attribution models possible at one end to dark social and touch points that we'll never be able to measure. Yeah. Um, and I think I agree making sense of all of that so hard. And what do you do when you're in that mess? You go back to your individual customers, your individual market. You understand where they get their information, what information they need, how you can best deliver it to them. And then you cut through the noise by looking at your specific audience, right? Rather yeah. than what everyone else is telling you to do online, which might work really well if you're selling trainers, but might not even be any good in B2B or B2B life science or B2B life science lab automation or lab okay. automation NGS, right? It's like, you need to yeah. find that. So, so I think that's really, that's good advice. Um, right. We're going to drift towards the end now. And I really wanted to yeah. ask you about your favorite marketing campaign or program that you'd worked on. So maybe we make that the last question for today, James. Oh, um, it's one of two things, or three things. No, oh, we put, uh, we have a little thing. I think it's got, it's got to be the Invigo brand project because it was so impactful in terms of the size, the scale. Um, and, and having never done that before, as in conceive a brand, launch a brand, establish the brand, um, mm -hmm. And the journey we went on, we're working with Landor Associates, one of the leading agencies in, 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 in the world in, on, on brand and going through that process and understanding how that, you know, how to build a brand platform, how to then get your messaging that came off the back of that, then to put the imagery against it that's kind of supported what those messages were. And then rolling that out to like 4,000 people globally and then taking it to market and all the channels that we utilize for that, the budget that we were actually allowed to go spend, because I think uh, marketing, everyone thinks, Big companies got massive budgets that so you've got to be quite creative in, in in that and to see that go from a concept to an actuality so then something that had value to by which somebody then came and thought right okay i get what the invigo brand means there's something we're going to invest in um now sorry to say you know invigo brand itself has probably been now absorbed into lab core and you know some, some other bits but also it's now standalone um, and also animal supply so it's kind of going back, it's gone back down again. It's still alive, but it's just not the same scale. But doing that project, um, team I worked with, uh, Jim Regan at the time, he, he was, he was a partner in crime on that one, um, brought Kate Newell in, um, right at the beginning on the first, the first day. And I'll tell you, a, I'll tell you a funny story about that when we're, we're, we're off and I call, um, <laughs> in terms, in terms of making a first day. Sorry, oh, listeners, that uh, one's not for yeah, you. Yeah, no, that, was, yeah, that one. <laughs> Um, in terms of a, a misspelled email anyway. So, um, yeah, I think that whole process and then the team that we started to build up under that, and that's what allowed me to kind of then platform and have the strength of brand to go, right, well, ABM, how does that play a part in where, how we go forward? Then I had Kerry running the comms team and in, in events and stuff like that, that the, that the were kind of just out there getting that brand out, getting the name out giving people a platform to work to. And it was just, yeah, I think it was just really energized times. You know, the whole management team were behind it and it just everything that we did was structured and well-developed and the rollout was crisp and everything. Yes, it was hard work in the background and late nights and a few challenging times at different points. But when you saw it land, that's what gave me that marketing lead feel of, We've done this, we've done it together. We've got an outcome. And I think that's where I'd take throughout my career, always like the outcome of things, even from designing a post and thinking, oh yeah, that looks really good, really cool. To then get into today's kind of world where it's kind of, okay, we've got this robust, well-rounded output. The conclusion is where we want it to get to. And we've taken people on a journey to get there. And I think having a great team around me allows me to achieve these things because without them. You know, it's hard to do. You can't do anything, everything on your own. Um, so I've been lucky enough to work with some great people on that journey. And I think Invigo helped me as a marketer to really establish some really strong fundamentals from start to finish. And yeah, just, just, it was, uh, it's something I'm proud of. 
I suppose I'd probably say. You've yeah. definitely built amazing teams over the years that I've known you and, and found a way to attract and work with some of the best people, um, which I, in, I completely uh, appreciate what you're saying there in terms of the team effort. Uh, what was the biggest challenge of that rebrand project? Taking people on a journey by which they might have worked for one of those brands, the, uh, the legacy brands for 20 years. No, 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 no. We, we don't, we can't change it. We're known as this. As soon as we change our name, people will forget what we've achieved and what we've done and the, the signs that we've, you know, the, the breakthrough signs at different stages of, uh, of things. And they were skeptical that, you know, Vivo would just be a flash in the pan. It'd be here for two minutes, et cetera, et cetera. That was the, one of the biggest challenges, internal perception. And it's like, everything's going to change. Everything's going to be different. No, if things going to change. But everything to be better. Every, you'll have this, and you'll have this, and you'll have this. You've now got people that can, you, you, you've got uh, people that can support you in your role and move you, accelerate things quicker. And I think if we go back to anything, and it's, it's, in, it's in the words of SPT Lab Techs, you know, mission statement about accelerating science. Even back then, it was the same thing. Science needs to accelerate to be able to answer the questions that it needs to kind of answer. And so having people understand that. By doing these things, by it's a name change, yes, but it's an ethos. You're changing the culture and the vibe, and the the, the brand isn't just a, a logo on a wall. It's the way a company can kind of come together, and the new values that you put together around that brand will help people accelerate what they're trying to do. So, yes, you may not like the name, but what it's going to help you do is you have more support or other teams or peers across the the much wider scope. They're going to help you get somewhere quicker, and that might be your box, but you achieve your box so much quicker through, through that kind of interaction. And so I think that was the biggest challenge, taking people to understand that they're not going to lose them, their own personality in it and their own achievements. It's still going to be there. It's going to be a different name and a different culture, but you, you might go and achieve something better. So Awesome. Well, James, thank you so much for sharing your story and your expertise with us today. I really, really yeah. appreciate it. If people have questions, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Email, LinkedIn, what's best? Uh, LinkedIn, yeah. Um, now, you, you might see I've got a bit of a, I don't know, pretentious name. So I've got up James A. Smith, but I've done it for the pure fact of then I can see if somebody's actually writing me a personal message or it's just a, a generated kind of in-mail. So that's why oh, I've got James, James A. Smith on on LinkedIn because uh, it's my filter. Um, so yeah, <laughs> go on there, send me an email. I'm happy to chat with anybody. Um, hopefully some people will take some, some learnings um, or learnings positively or don't do it like James. Um, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, when we meet up, I'll tell you about the, the email faux pas. Paul. Great stuff. Appreciate that, James. Thanks very much. Enjoy okay, the rest mate. of your day. Cheers. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Life Science and Marketing Podcast. For your regular dose of cutting-edge life science marketing insights, don't forget to subscribe. Join us again in two weeks for another engaging expert discussion.